everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Exploring Reality, where you get to learn about the rational side of the Christian faith. I'm going to give the audience another three minutes to get acquainted in here and get set up. And then we're going to have Dr. Joshua Rasmussen give a presentation on consciousness. See you soon. Dr. Rasmussen, I've been so excited about this for a while. Um, go ahead and just introduce yourself and uh, we can kind of go from there. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm Josh Rasmussen and I'm a professor of philosophy at Azusa Pacific University. One of my areas of interest is trying to understand and uncover the basic nature of things, whatever they are, whether they're consciousness, which we're going to be talking about today, Mm -hmm. or just the nature of reality, fundamental existence. So this is kind of my area of, of primary focus. And yeah, so and I also like to tell people that um, I have something in common with everybody else, which is that I am a person. And so mm -hmm. that's something I like about myself. And I have that in common with everybody else. Awesome. So you have a presentation for us today. Um, are you ready for me to bring that up? Yeah, sounds great. Awesome. Here you go. Um, I'll just kind of be quiet and let you take it from here. Okay. Well, thank you for having me on and for this opportunity. I'm very excited to be doing this because I've been thinking a lot about the nature of consciousness, the nature of beings. I'm working on a book on this topic. I've been reading a lot of the latest science on this topic, some of which is, is very interesting to me and is blowing my mind. It's not what I would have expected from a certain narrative that I received uh, when I was in graduate school about science and consciousness and brains. But today, what I want to just talk with you guys about is this question, are you a brain? And this is a difficult question because it relates to other difficult questions, including what is a brain and what are you? But my goal in this talk is to see if we can get a, at least some clarity on uh, some of the things that are at stake and what it takes to answer a question like this. So here's my great purpose. Uh, in this time, which is to show you how you can shine light on your own self by certain powers you have within you. In fact, even just this morning, I woke up and I guess because the topic's on my mind, I was thinking about myself, I was thinking about my brain, and I was thinking about the relationship between thinking of myself through introspection, looking inward, concentrating on my thoughts, my feelings, and that sort of meanness, the, 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 that sense of being someone who has thoughts and feelings, and then comparing that with my sense of, of uh, geometric structures, including geometric structures in brains, 
And there are tools that we can use to investigate these things and to get some clarity. So here's my main thesis. My thesis is that your brain displays the operations of and interactions with a deeper reality, which you don't actually have to guess at. You can actually witness this via first person introspection. You have a kind of access to your thoughts and feelings. This is how you can tell whether you're feeling happy or sad. I'm not claiming that this access is infallible, but that you do have information that you can gather up by paying attention inwardly through introspection. I'm going to talk about how this power of introspection can help us collect data that's relevant to this question about the kind of being you are and how you are related to brains. Now, I realize that there can be a broad audience here. And what I really want to do is articulate how I'm thinking about things and invite the audience to sort of think it through for themselves, turn over these ideas in your own mind. You might disagree with certain things that I propose, and that's totally fine because my whole goal is to point to powers that I think you have to investigate this from your own perspective. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do. So let me just share just a little bit about my own thinking about consciousness and how it's changed over the years. Uh, I remember having a conversation with some colleagues as a computer programmer at work when I was in college about consciousness, the nature of the mind. And at that time, I remember making an argument that consciousness could be completely and entirely analyzable in terms of third person uh, materialistic structures of a brain. And the person I was talking with didn't seem to agree with that. They said there seemed to be something different about consciousness and that it wouldn't be possible to build a conscious thing just by assembling chips, computer chips in the right way. It might act conscious, but it could never actually have that subjective feeling of being conscious. Well, I wasn't so sure. I was kind of agnostic about that. I was open to that. And then I got into graduate school and I began taking courses in the philosophy of mind. I took a course by Jaguan Kim, a philosopher who wrote the book Physicalism or Something Near Enough. He's an expert in the field. Um, Alvin Plantinga, uh, Michael Tooley, J.P. Moreland, and others. And these courses really blew my mind about the nature of consciousness and and the different theories um, and, and what you can actually investigate about consciousness using introspection, using science. And my view began to, to change. I, I feel like those classes helped to orient me to something that I think we can all actually witness easily just by reflecting inwardly on ourselves and seeing, oh, there's my thoughts, things. And we can actually make comparisons between things in consciousness. And I'm going to talk more about that and how this power that we have to make comparisons is actually very useful for gathering information relevant to the question about our relationship to brains. So my thinking about consciousness has changed, and my goal in this talk is to share just one little bit of why and how it's changed. So what I find to be very helpful sometimes in thinking about big topics is to divide the territory into some of the main theories. So this is going to be just a very quick bird's eye perspective of three different main theories of consciousness. The first theory, some of you may have heard of this, is a limitivism. According to this theory, consciousness, at least the first person aspects of consciousness, they're not actually real. Uh, we could take a, a whole talk just on this, and I'm not going to do that. But here I just want to point to a common challenge, which is to account for your immediate experience with your own consciousness. So if you eliminate thoughts, if you think there are no thoughts, but instead maybe there are certain neurological correlates. Um, the problem though, is that you might take yourself to just be aware of your own thoughts directly within your own consciousness. Now here, what I wanna just point to is this power of introspection, which is I think very important. This is the power to look inwardly, to have a sense that you have thoughts and feelings. And I would argue, I would actually argue that you need this power to do science because science is based on observation and testing those observations, uh, uh, making hypotheses that you test with the observations. But in order to even know that you've made observations, in order for me to know that I personally made an observation, I need to have some kind of awareness of the observation, uh, this experience of observing something. And this power to be aware that I'm experiencing something is this introspective power. 
it's a power by which I look inwardly and, and can witness, oh, I'm, I'm actually experiencing, um, I'm actually making an observation. So I would argue that in order to do science, uh, we actually do have this power of introspection, but there's a whole big debate about that. And I don't want to go more into that except just to point to uh, that this power, I think, is relevant to this question about whether consciousness exists. I think probably most people watching this could probably think, okay, thoughts and feelings, those are real. But the big question is, what is their nature? How are they related to brain systems? So another theory would be a reductive materialist theory. And this theory is going to be the focus of my talk today. And this would say that first person aspects are analyzable in terms of third person material aspects, such as shapes, motions, positions, compositions of particles, and then functions of these, where a function would be an ordered set of inputs to outputs. So you have certain shapes as an input, certain shapes as an output, change of shape. These would all be examples of third person material aspects. A challenge here is to account for certain apparent differences between conscious states, uh, first person experiential states, and third person uh, geometric or brain states. And we'll talk more about that in this talk. And then finally, there's non-reductive theories, which I'm going to call conscious realism. This will say that first person aspects are real and irreducible to these third person material aspects. Uh, conscious realism will include a range of different views. It'll include a range of physicalist views, uh, idealist views, which treat mentality as fundamental to everything else, as well as um, certain kind of um, uh, duality views, <clears throat> dual property views, and uh, substance dualist views. I'm In this talk, I'm not going to go into those different views. I'm going to just put them all under one umbrella, which I'm calling conscious realism, and my thesis is, is going to be to argue for conscious realism. So to be fair, I should probably point to a challenge of my own view, which is conscious realism, which is that then there's this mind body problem of how if third person brain states aren't the same thing as first person conscious states, how are these things able to interact? And I'll point to a few things about how that might work in this talk. Uh, but my main goal is to provide an argument for conscious realism. So my roadmap is to provide an argument. I'm going to call this the blue Lego argument for conscious realism. Then I'm going to address three objections to help clarify the argument. Then I'm going to propose what I think is the best path, path forward if you're a materialist. So if you're a materialist and you're watching this, you might initially get the sense that maybe I'm arguing against materialism. I'm actually not. Um, I'm arguing against a certain form of reductive materialism but I think there's a, another way to go if you're a materialist. There's a way of characterizing matter that I think fits very well with our latest science, our latest physics, and that can account for the reality of subjective experiences. And so I'll get to that at the end. Hey, Dr. Rasmussen. Yeah. I hate to cut you off. Um, sure. Are you switching the slides on your screen? I am. Okay. Are you not, not able to see the switches? No, we're not seeing that for some reason. Um... Okay. Um... How did you share your screen? Are you doing it with through the window or it's sharing a window? Yes. Do you want to try? I'll stop sharing and then I will share in a different way. Awesome. Okay. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no, thank you for doing that because those slides make all the difference. Um, let's see here. Share, share screen. Okay. Come back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> Joe Schmid says, Josh is love, Josh is life. <laughs> uh, so is Joe. Oh, I Joe, love and I, Joe. Joe and I also have this in common that we're both also persons, I believe. <laughs> okay, can you see the different slides now? Uh, it's not coming up on my screen for me to share it again. Can you try? You clicked on the bottom thing where it says share. Yeah, and I shared the whole screen this time. Let's see. Yeah, that's not coming up for some reason. Would it help if I sent this to you? Yeah, do you want to email it to me real quick? Yeah, let me do okay. that. Sorry, guys. Give us a second here. This is okay. Our consciousness is at work changing the <laughs> material world. OK. 
You know, this is actually evidence that consciousness has effects on the material world because we're forming intentions, <laughs> desires. My friend Josh says, not sure about uh, Joe being a human. He's definitely a machine. <laughs> <laughs> he publishes things like a machine. His output in philosophical creativeness is machine-like. Okay. Almost there. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Okay, I just awesome. Sent it. I'm just refreshing the page until <laughs> until it shows up. There we go. Cool. Let me just get this brought up. So since you are going to have it over there, does that mean that you will be changing the slides? Yeah, most likely. Okay, that's fine. I'll just tell you when to click. Yep. Let me just pull it up in presenting mode. I don't know if that's going to work, actually. All right. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Let's see if this will work. Can you see that changing? Awesome. And then you wanted to be on this slide, Dr. Rasmussen? Um, I'm not even seeing your slides. Um, let me see what's going on here. It's showing up on the, on the stream. Are you on the stream yard? Okay. I'm seeing it now. Okay. Okay. Cool. The blue Lego, the blue Lego argument. Um, yeah. Okay. There we go. Awesome. Well, yeah. I'll uh, bump myself out again and then just tell me when you want to go to the next slide. Okay. And well, this will be a little bit tricky because there's going to be clicking through the parts of the slides. So I'm going to just talk and I'm going to allow you just do it according to your wisdom and I have faith it's going to work out. So, okay. I'll <laughs> okay. just do, I'll do one of these whenever I think that's what you're trying to show. <laughs> okay. That sounds great. Yeah. You can do that. Um, yeah. Just feel free to do that and, and feel feel like you're not going to make a mistake. And then I think you won't. So, okay. So this, this blue Lego right here, although my son tells me it's a mega block, he's like, it's not a Lego. It's a mega block. Okay. But I mean, it looks, it's good enough. Okay. So first premise, a blue Lego is not thinking about me. This mega block is not thinking about me. Um, that's my premise. And I always like to ask people, you know, like, do you agree with me on that? And then if they say yes, then my next question is always like, well, how do you know? Uh, so continue to the next slide. Oh, no, it's not breaking it up into pieces. It's showing it all at once. Okay, well, that, that just makes it so that there's less suspense, but it probably makes it easier to present it. So here's the objection um, to the premise, to the first premise of my argument. Okay, so I, I want my argument to be secure. And so I don't want to get away with the premise too easily. If you do think that this Lego is not thinking about you. Um, I, I agree with that, but I want to get clear about like what supports that, like why I really think that's true. So how do I know the blue Lego isn't thinking about me even while it has no means to indicate its thoughts, right? So maybe it is thinking about me, but it just like can't tell me that it's thinking about me. It doesn't have vocal cords um, and it just, it, it can't give me that information. So you might reply, and this is the reply that I got off of Facebook when I uh, asked my philosopher friend this question, and this is the most common reply, which is that the reason that we know that this isn't having thoughts is that it doesn't have a nervous system. So this blue Lego doesn't have a nervous system, and only things that have a nervous system can have thoughts. Therefore, the blue Lego lacks thoughts. 
so that will then support my first premise, you know, which would make me happy. I want support for my first premise. But the problem that I have with this argument is that that second premise seems to be, a, in fact, it presupposes the very assumption in question, which is, can a thought be undetected by us? In other words, could it be that there are systems that are very un, much unlike the systems that we're used to that realize thoughts, um, but these systems realize thoughts perhaps in another way? So maybe it has particles and maybe they're having certain feelings together. Maybe this block is now feeling a little bit nervous that we're talking about it. It feels embarrassed by this. How could we ever know? Maybe it's thinking, stop thinking about me. How could we really know that? So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to um, take us a little bit deeper. And I think that the way there is a way that we can actually get clearer knowledge uh, about, about the, the thinking power of a blue Lego. And I think the way that we get clear knowledge is by using that tool of introspection and collecting some data. So if we apply introspection to our own consciousness, we'll find within there. Well, I don't want to say we, I'll just say what I find within me. And then I invite you to consider it from your perspective. Maybe you'll find something different, right? But when I consider my own consciousness, I start to begin to find um, thoughts in there. So right now I'm having a thought, let's see. Am I having a thought? Let me let me be real about this. Let me generate it. Okay, I just thought that my wife is beautiful. Okay, I just seriously just had that thought. Now, when I focus in on that thought, I can discover some aspects of the thought by focusing on the thought, my wife is beautiful, and I'm looking within. You don't have to close your eyes to do this, but sometimes it can help, you know, not be distracted by shapes and colors. You can focus in on thoughts and you can begin to investigate properties of thoughts. So here on the slide, I have five listed. Um, this dispense was that number five is a bonus it's a bonus aspect. But the first one is aboutness. So I noticed that my thought that Rachel is beautiful is about Rachel. I notice it's an aspect of that thought. And I detect that aspect right within the thought itself. I, I, I'm aware of that aspect of the thought. There are different theories of aboutness. I'm not going to go into them. But in some sense, it seems like that thought is about Rachel. Second, there's a kind of structure or propositional content. Um, the thought that Rachel is beautiful. Somebody else could have that same thought. Maybe there are people in the audience who would have that same thought, uh, but their thoughts are over in their minds. My thoughts over in my mind. There's a kind of propositional content or structure that's in common, that's shared between these thoughts. And I discover this by inspecting my own thought. And I, I see that content within that thought. And, um, and I can also see aspects of that content, such as that that content could be true or correspond with reality, even if I'm not having the thought. So this is how I can come to think that other people could have the same content um, and the content could correspond with reality, uh, even if you're not actually having that thought. So this actually leads to the third aspect, which is the truth value. The truth value would be whether the thought is true or false. Um, there's different theories about how this works. You might think that the thought is true by having a content that matches with reality. Uh, I've got a book where I give an analysis of truth and defend this kind of correspondence account of truth. But here, I'm going to just leave that completely open. Um, the point is, is that there's something in the thought that you can detect. This is where you can find truth or falsehood. I actually think that this is the clearest when you have thoughts about other parts within your, within your consciousness. So like, for example, instead of thinking about Rachel, now I think about my own consciousness. So I have the thought, let's say that I'm feeling happy and then I can check, okay, is there a happiness in me? And I look at my thought, I'm feeling happy. I don't look at it with my eyes, but I pay attention to it within introspective awareness. And then I see that, oh, it's true that um, I'm feeling happy. There's a kind of match between the reality of my happiness and the thought, I see that match directly. And I think that's where I get this concept of truth. Next, you can also detect that thoughts can be linked together with uh, by logical links, like uh, the, the and or or. You can have the thought that two plus two equals four and snow is white. And that combines two thoughts into a more complex thought. And then finally, there's a kind of experience or what philosophers call a phenomenal aspect or quality to having a thought. There's this feeling of ha consciously having a thought. 
that two plus two equals four. There's a kind of content to what that's like, what that feels like for me to have that thought. So those are some aspects. I don't claim that these are the only aspects. These are just some of the ones that I find within my own awareness of my thoughts. And I believe that you have the power to detect these within uh, your thoughts as well. And that you wouldn't find these just by looking at shapes or colors um, or by inspecting Lego pieces. You're not going to find these particular aspects uh, using your eyeballs. Uh, instead, you have to use this other power to detect these aspects. So I don't think I can really overemphasize the value of this power to look within and get information within your own consciousness. It's through this power that you get information about logic itself and the logical links between thoughts and the, the foundations of language. You get information about that through introspection on your own thoughts and the elements within your own consciousness. I think that sometimes it's easy to mistake things that are familiar, like thoughts and feelings, for things that are just like insignificant. So we sort of look past them, and we look out into the world, and we try to find information out there. But the information right within is very important. And I think we can discover some very important things about ourselves. And insofar as we are parts of reality, we can find out some very significant things about parts of reality by looking within. We have this window right within ourselves to see important aspects of reality. All right, so if you continue, then we can see how we can apply um, these aspects to the topic at hand, which is about our relationship to material structures. So I think that we can use what I'm calling the direct comparison test to see some things, to see that some things are different from some other things. So you can test, for example, whether aspect A is identical to aspect B by a kind of direct comparison. For example, you can test whether being four is the same as being three by comparing four and three right within your own mind. I think you have that power. Um, I've asked people sometimes, like my kids, for example, uh, is a square the same as a circle? And they say no. And then, of course, you know, because they've given me their answer, I have to ask them, well, how do you know that? What's your evidence? Why do you believe that, right? And so they're scratching their heads. And, and usually they say, well, because the square has four sides and a circle doesn't have four sides. It's like, okay, well, circles maybe not the best example because a circle has zero sides or maybe it has infinitely many sides. I don't know how you want to describe that. But let's say they say it has zero sides. Okay, well, but why do you think that zero is not the same as four? Because that argument for square being different than circle presupposes that zero sides is not the same as four sides. And at some level, I mean, maybe the question could feel kind of annoying, but I think that's because at some level you just see. You just see that zero is not four. And you don't need to rely on authority. You don't need to rely on mathematicians telling you this or anybody else figuring this out for you. You can see within your own mind that zero is not four. And so you can see that a square is not a circle. There are other things you can see within your own mind. You can see that certain concepts are different from other concepts. The concept of a sheep is different from the concept, from your concept of a, of a bicycle. How do you know that? You don't have to check your brain parts. You just check the concepts and you just see directly differences. So you have this basic power to see differences. So what I say here is that the direct comparison test works. You can apply it in cases where the items in question, A and B, are actually both within your field of immediate awareness. Okay, This is, this is not just a conceptual awareness. This is your immediate conscious awareness. Like, like right now, if, if you have a conscious awareness of some shape and some color within your field of view, perhaps stimulated from pixels and uh, uh, lights and photons coming into your eyes, you come into immediate conscious awareness of some geometry here and some colors. Then you can compare the items that are within your immediate conscious awareness. You can compare like this shape here, the circular shape with, the, with this sort of um, square shape. And you can see whether they're the same or not. Now, what happens if A is in your conscious awareness, but B is not in your conscious awareness? Then can you compare them? Well, you can't use the direct comparison test, but you can actually use another test, which is a test of identity using Leibniz's law. So Leibniz's law says that if A and B are the same thing, then whatever's true of A is true of B. So if there's something true of A that's not true of B, such as 
being in your awareness or not being in your awareness, if A is in your awareness and B is not at all in your awareness, then A and B aren't the same thing. There's something true of the one that's not true of the other. Um, a way of illustrating this is that you might think that the backside of this Lego is within your awareness. Uh, this side is in your awareness, even while the other side is not within your awareness. And you could then use that as evidence that this side that's in your awareness is not the same as the side that's outside of your awareness, because to be inside of your awareness is not identical with being outside of your awareness. And so then you can show that there's a difference that way. Okay, I hope that makes sense. I'm going to show how we can, in the next slide now, how we can apply this direct comparison test to the, uh, the Lego. So I say that the first person aspects of thoughts, aboutness, structure, truth, value, logical links are not the same as, I'm going to just use one clear example here, blue, okay? Bring blue within your mind and compare it with aboutness. See if they're the same. So here's how I think about it. Either blue, I'm talking about qualitative blue, the, the blue that you that you can be acquainted with. Um, well, I should be careful here because there are different theories about how to analyze blue. So that's, in fact, that's why what I have next allows you to uh, have some different options. So either blue is something that can be within your field of conscious awareness, okay, or not. So you might think like if you can dream in color and you colors, you're literally seeing colors in your conscious awareness, qualitative colors. Or you might have an analysis of colors so that those aren't actually colors. Those are um, intentional items that point to colors that are outside of your conscious awareness. Um, and maybe they, they try to point, but they actually fail. There's not actually anything blue there. So either something blue is in your conscious awareness or not. If blue can be in your field of awareness, then you can see by direct comparison that blue is not about this. If instead blue cannot be within your field of awareness, because maybe you understand blue in terms of wavelengths of light that are external to your immediate conscious awareness, then you can see by logical deduction that blue is not aboutness, since aboutness can be within your field of conscious awareness, whereas on this uh, account, blue cannot be. So there's something different between them. So either way, whether by direct comparison or by logical deduction, you can see that blue is not the same as aboutness. All right, so continue on to the next slide. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, maybe maybe that's clear, right? But how do we how do we get something grand about your relationship to brains? Well, my method here is to get very very clear about something, so that we can then use the clear as a flashlight, so we can see more clear things. I think this is a very important method in thinking and and trying to understand reality is to start with like, what is the clearest to me? And then if I can search for the clear, then I can see if I can build from there. So it seems clear to me that aboutness is not the same as the color blue. Um, but then by the same reasoning that I apply to see that aboutness and blue are distinct, I can now gather up what I'm going to call deep support for my first premise in my argument, which is that a blue Lego is, is not actually thinking about me. So let's assume for sake of argument that a blue Lego is purely material. And by that, I just mean that a complete description of its third person material aspects, its shape, position, motion, uh, these sorts of aspects that you could analyze in the vocabulary of let's say fundamental physics. Maybe it doesn't have to be fundamental physics, but it's, it's characteristic third person uh, material properties. Then if that, um, we're gonna assume that that's gonna be a complete description of all of its aspects. And I'm gonna assume this for sake of argument because the goal of my argument is to show that there's something more to you than third person uh, material aspects. And so I'm gonna assume that at least this Lego is purely and entirely material uh, kind of for sake of argument. Uh, at the end, I'll talk about another way of analyzing matter that can make things more complex. But if that's right, if that's what matter is, and if that's what this Lego is made of third person matter, then if a blue Lego is thinking about me, then it follows that every aspect of a thought is a third person material aspect. Because if this is having thoughts, and this is purely characterized in terms of third person material aspects, then it will follow that every aspect of a thought is characterized in terms of third-person material aspects. But first-person aspects of thoughts 
aren't the same as purely third person material aspects of a Lego, such as shape, position, motion, functions of these. And, and I argue for this by direct comparison. Um, insofar as these things, shape, motion, position can be within my conscious awareness, I can just directly compare the shape with the aboutness of a thought or the other attributes of a thought, the logical links or and. And then I can see there's distinction there. Um, if the shape is not within my conscious awareness, well, then there's distinction because the aboutness of the thought is within my conscious awareness. And so then you get distinction that way. So either way, it follows that a blue Lego is not thinking about me. And this is maybe a deeper way of arguing for that first premise. All right, you can continue. And so then the next premise is that if a blue Lego is not thinking about me, then neither is any other purely third person material brain. I might think that's the tough premise. Well, if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna just point out here that um, the same argument that I just gave for the Lego not thinking about me will apply to any purely third person uh, material structures. We just use the exact same reasoning. So assume for sake of argument that a brain is purely material, a complete description of its material aspects is a complete description of all of its aspects. Well, then if a brain is thinking about me, then every aspect of a thought is a third person brain aspect, shape, motion, functions of these, et cetera. But first person aspects of thoughts are not third person uh, material brain aspects. I think we can see these distinctions by direct comparison. And the same way that we can see that one is not two, that blue is not black, that true is not false, that a feeling of happiness is not a feeling of sadness, that a thought of a giraffe is not the same as a feeling of hope, um, that a shape of a square is not the same as the feeling of sadness. I think we can compare these things when they're in our immediate conscious awareness. And if that's right, then it follows from these premises that a brain is not just by third person brain aspects thinking about me. I put that in brackets because I'm leaving room for, for a wider understanding of the nature of matter, which I'll talk about at the end of this. All right, you can continue to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, a, a striking number of philosophers do accept the second premise. Um, there's many different philosophers I could quote here. This quote, I love Alexander Rosenberg. He's a philosopher of science and he's able to articulate these ideas very skillfully which is something I very much appreciate about him. So he says here that physics has ruled out the existence of clumps of matter of the required sort. These are, he's talking about um, thoughts that can be about other things. Uh, there are just fermions and bosons and combinations of them, but none of that stuff is all by itself about any other stuff. There's nothing in the whole universe, including of course, all the neurons in your brain that just by its nature or composition do the job of being about some other clump of matter. So he's sort of following this argument that the purely third person physical descriptions of, of things that have motion and figures and shapes and geometries and functions of those and changes of those is it that that's going to leave out the first person subjective qualitative aspects of consciousness, of thinking, of feeling, of hoping, of desiring. And it's not just a, a matter of combining shapes to form the qualitative experience of feeling happy, for example, or thinking a thought, because mere combinations of shapes lead to more complex geometric structures, but those are still not the same thing as, even if they represent or encode or causally inter, interrelate with consciousness, that there's, that there's a distinction there that you can actually see by direct comparison. All right, now um, you can go to the next slide here at this point. Thank you. So let me just put the argument then together. Um, so the blue Lego argument goes like this. A blue Lego is not thinking about me. If a blue Lego is not thinking about me, then the deep support, the deep reason that I gave for why I think a blue Lego is not thinking about me in so far as it's purely a material, then neither is any other purely material structure or brain thinking about me for that same reason. Therefore, no purely material brain is thinking about me. Now, premise four, this is the one that um, Alexander Rosenberg is going to reject, uh, but this is the premise that I'm thinking about me. And my argument for this 
is, well, in a way, I don't even have an argument for this. I just have this tool of introspection and I claim that I'm able to shine introspection within and just see, ah, there I am thinking about myself. Uh, you know, if, if I don't have that tool, if I can't use that tool, well, then I can't really verify that fourth premise. I don't arrive at this fourth premise by positing my existence to best account for what we know scientifically. Uh, I think this fits very well with everything we know scientifically, as far as I can tell. But the way that I verify my own existence is not by a theoretical posit, but by looking inward and just seeing. It's the same way that I think that I can see that two plus two equals four. I pay attention. I see those numbers. I see how they relate to each other. I have this power to just see that. Um, so I would actually argue not that I don't exist because material stuff can't um, account for my existence, but rather that I do exist and that therefore I'm not a purely material brain. That's how I would run the argument. I would let the clear light of introspection lead me to this conclusion if I can't account for my existence in purely third person materialistic terms. And then finally, if I'm not purely material, uh, well, I don't think that I'm special in this regard. Uh, I would infer that you probably aren't purely material as well. And you can obviously run the argument from your own perspective. So therefore it follows, if all this is right, that you are not a purely material brain. Okay, so if you wanna continue, I've got three objections. In the interest of time, maybe what we'll do is we'll do objection one and then we'll skip to objection three and we can talk about questions at the end. So there's this famous water H2O objection. The objection goes like this. You can be aware of water without being aware of H2O. Yet water is H2O. Okay, so just because you can be aware of the one without the other, it doesn't follow that they're different. That would be a logical fallacy. In the same way, you can be aware of first person aspects of consciousness without being aware of material aspects of the brain, even if they actually are the same. And so my whole argument um, has to be problematic. It's fallacious. Now, there's a lot of things I could say in reply. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting things clearer. Um, so first thing, what I have here on the slide is that you're not actually directly aware of the molecular structure of water. You don't have that direct acquaintance with the molecular structure of water. That's why we did scientific investigation to find, okay, what is best explaining the readings on our, on our instruments? And we can investigate that. And so the direct comparison test is not going to apply in this case because the direct comparison test applies when we have the items in question and we can compare them. By contrast, you are directly acquainted with, or so I argue, with first-person aspects of consciousness. That's how I can know that I'm thinking and feeling without first checking with the, the patterns in my brain. I, I can just directly tell what I'm thinking and feeling. And note here that you are acquainted with experiential effects of water maybe like how it tastes to you or this sort of experience with its liquidity. But those effects aren't the same as the molecular structure. And you can actually argue for that using the, the direct comparison test. Um, actually, let me revise that. In this case, it's not that you directly compare the effects with the, uh, with the cause. It's that the cause is outside your conscious awareness. So now you can apply Leibniz's law that that which is outside your conscious awareness can't be the same as that which is in your conscious awareness. That would lead to a contradiction. So therefore the effects of water that you experience in consciousness are not literally the same thing as the molecular structure that causes those effects. If that makes sense. Hope that makes sense. Okay. We're, we're, we're in deep waters here. So, um, so, you know, if, if there are questions here, um, it's because these are deep waters and hopefully we can, talk about those. Uh, yeah. So if you continue on to the next slide, the next one after that, yep, there you go. Um, th this is kind of a popular style objection that sometimes gets brought up that uh, often I think kind of blocks people from really paying attention to what they can detect through introspection, really doing the work of collecting the data, doing the work of making those comparisons, doing the work of thinking through these arguments, because the feeling is that, well, we already know from neuroscience that mental aspects are all correlated with and therefore reduced to brain aspects. And that kind of um, authoritative argument sometimes blocks careful attention to some relevant distinctions. 
And so what I love about this objection is that it does invite some clarification. So here in the replies, I have a couple points. Uh, first is that correlation, mere correlation is not identity. So it's consistent with all the empirical evidence we have about minds, uh, consciousness, and brain states that there's a uh, du dual interaction between them. It's also consistent with the evidence that we have that the uh, mental states really do reduce the brain states. Uh, it's also consistent with the evidence that we have that we can analyze the brain states in terms of more fundamental uh, mental states. And so that mentality is actually the sort of prior and primary uh, framework from which brains themselves are to be analyzed. These three different conceptual um, theses or philosophical theses are fully compatible with everything in neuroscience uh, in terms of the correlations between conscious states and brain states. You can have correlation without identity. When my wife plays the piano, she creates beautiful music. My experience of that music is correlated with the pressing of the keys, but my experience of the music isn't the same thing as the pressing of the keys. The sun rises, roosters crow. The sun is, is not a rooster. The rising of the sun is not the crowing of a rooster. And then the other point here is in my study of neuroscience, and there's many different studies I could point to, but I just have a few here on, on the slides, um, indicate evidence of consciousness affecting uh, geometric states within the brain. That like, if you actually focus your attention in certain ways, you can actually heal aspects of your brain. And there's a lot of science about this that's being put to practical use. And that moreover, there's not actually an identified um, physical correlate of the cause of these physical changes. What's identified is the consciousness that seems to be affecting the geometric changes and the structural and informational changes in the brain. Now, that isn't to say that there isn't an underlying physical correlate. Um, you know, it could be that we just haven't found it. So I want to be careful with this kind of an argument. But there's a lot of interesting research that is indicating that there are cases where uh, decreased physical patterns are correlated with increased richness of consciousness that, that the, and then the conscious, that increased richness of consciousness has physical effects in the brain. Um, and not just in the brain, but there's also studies about consciousness having remote effects on other brains through, well, there's different theories of how this might work, perhaps through uh, the, a quantum field. But now this does go beyond my own expertise in terms of the details of those scientific studies. What I'm happy to point to is just that however those scientific studies play out, whatever one's analysis is of that data, that's going to be consistent with the argument that I gave, which is that there's consciousness that's correlated with aspects of the brain, even if that correlation isn't a matter of identity. All right, next slide. So here's what I want to say on behalf of materialists. Um, so the best option I see for the materialists is to uh, think of matter as itself being mindful. And what do I mean by that? Well, that matter itself has real subjective aspects, thinking and feeling, or at least matter is capable of having real subjective aspects. And here I want to just point out that this is something that it took me a while to see clearly this distinction. It's not just that matter generates consciousness. It's that matter can have consciousness, right? Because it's not, it's not just that you generate consciousness when you have thoughts, you generate thoughts in your mind or feelings or whatever. It's that you are a bearer who has consciousness. And so if you are uh, fully material, then if you're a material thing, then on this account, uh, you would have, you won't just generate consciousness, you also have consciousness. Next, that mindful matter accords with recent physics about the fundamental nature of matter. I've been reading Carlo Rivelli, uh, who talks about the fundamental aspects of the quantum field as being informational, non-spatial, and relational, which some analyze in terms of observer dependence. That observer dependence itself is open to further analysis. But one way we can understand this is that the fundamental nature of matter itself can be characterized in mentalistic terms. So that's a possibility. On this theory, matter itself, the stuff out of which visible things are constituted, would be more than third person material or material in the way that is sort of standardly thought or often conceived. 
And then my final note here, and I don't want to go into this, is just to point out that if matter is mindful, so it has subjective aspects of consciousness, but it's fundamentally mindless, then I think we have a certain kind of um, hard problem of consciousness where there's this problem of explaining how the mindful aspects of matter grow out of the completely mindless aspects of matter. If we reverse this, then we don't have that same kind of problem. I've been thinking a lot about this sort of kind of reverse um, hard problem of consciousness, which you might characterize as the problem of how from consciousness you get unconscious things. Well, one way that I think about this is that uh, my, my visual images in my mind, um, those things don't have their own consciousness. It's not like my image of a sheep is itself thinking or feeling. It's So in that sense, it's unconscious. But I'm able to generate and have visual images. I'm able to have thoughts that aren't themselves thinking. They aren't themselves conscious. But I'm able to generate these things. And I witness the generation of these things within my own consciousness. I think there's a kind of basic... Um, causal connection here between the kind of being I, I am and then these states of geometric structures and visual imagery, thoughts, um, and other such states like that. Those states aren't themselves thinking and feeling, so they're unconscious in that sense, but they grow out of something that is capable of generating consciousness. Okay, there's so much more there. Um, I'm probably covering more ground than I need to here, but uh, I just want to point to some of those things and all of those things open up much more complexity. If you go to the next slide, then I will bring home some conclusions. So here's here's kind of how I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it that you actually have a power to see aspects of your own nature using this introspective power to look inward, to witness your thoughts and feelings. When you wake up in the morning, you you can witness your the familiar sensations of your body and you can look inward and you can witness I'm thinking, I'm feeling, there I am, I'm me. And you can have that experience and you can witness yourself having that experience by looking inward. By looking inward, I think that you can see by the clearest light that you are real, okay? And that's a very significant thing to see, that you are real and that you can think and feel. By this light, I think that you can also see that thinking and feeling have real first-person subjective aspects, not reducible to shapes and colors, and geometric forms or anything else that's purely third person. And if all of this is right, then what I conclude is that there's more to you than a purely third person material brain. There's more to you than that. Now the full ramifications of what that means and what that implies will be open for further discussion. But I wanted to end here on a reason to, to think that this very significant and controversial conclusion is true. So I hope that makes sense. That's my talk. Thank you. Awesome. So that was really cool. I, I, I looked through the slides that you sent me earlier and I, I just loved it right away. Um, but listening to you, like, I guess, exegete it <laughs> um, really aided and just gave some clarity. So how much time do you have left uh, for questions? I have some time. I was going to say, you know, if we took another 15 minutes or so, maybe we could talk okay. through some questions. Yeah. So, yeah, guys, uh, if you have questions, let me know in the chat. I saw some roll through already. Um, so let's see. Okay, so Sharice Baum asks, any book recommendations for a beginner on the topic of philosophy of mind? Oh, I was immediately going to say Hasker's Emergent Self um, is a very helpful book. I don't know if that would be for a beginner. Um, uh I'm struggling to think about books for beginners. The reason I think is because every book on this topic is pretty advanced. Chalmers, his book, um, all of it, he's got some popular books. I think, what is it? Consciousness Explained? I'd have to check the title. But if you look up Chalmers, um, he's got a book that is very readable for a beginner. I would highly recommend his work on this. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I know I know this is I was a question for Dr. Rasmus, <laughs> but Rutledge just put out their new introduction to the philosophy of mind as well. And nice. um, so I'll put that into the description of the video for anybody. And then I'll put the, the books that you recommend it to in the description for anybody that wants to look at that. Um, let's see. We didn't have too many questions, which is really surprising. Um, I thought there might be, be questions 
supporting and defending materialism. And I wanted to convey a certain friendliness to materialism. I, my goal here isn't to beat up against materialism. In fact, in my research, I've been very intrigued to discover both scientists and philosophers in various ways, philosophers from conceptual angles, and then scientists from a lot of interesting studies and experiments, um, seeming to converge on a kind of mindful materialism. So, it, you know, if you have the materialist paradigm, then rather than sort of shift that paradigm and move to a different one, you can sort of build the fundamental mentality into your paradigm. And then what ends up happening is that it feels almost like you're describing um, a paradigm that might look different, but it's you're actually just describing it in different terms. It's like ontologically and fundamentally, you're, you're kind of saying the same thing, that reality is fundamentally has these mental aspects. And, awesome. Um, yeah. So my very smart friend, Josh, <laughs> asks, um, have you read Vasella? Do you think his argument for a paradigm existent has a transcendental mind can be bolstered by your case here? Interesting. I read his book, Paradigm Existence, Paradigm Theory of Existence in graduate school. It's been a long time. So I'd have to really revisit that. Um, I, I bet there is a, a connection there, but I'd have to look into that. Well, now I'm going to have to read that too. <laughs> All right. Um, Bradley asks, uh, what were some of the problems you first encountered when trying to articulate this argument? So when I first articulated the argument in a more popular setting, the biggest problem had nothing with the argument. It had to do with the sort of science versus philosophy stereotypes. So there was this feeling that the argument wasn't scientifically credible because we already just know through neuroscience that consciousness is analyzable in terms of brain states. And that made it very difficult to give the argument. I, I've been actually thinking a lot about this is that arguments can't really be authority. So like if somebody's letting somebody else sort of build their beliefs, um, I can't affect their beliefs with a good argument because to even pay sufficient attention to the details within the argument requires almost like letting go of that authority. The authority already mm -hmm. makes it like impossible. Um, and so it's almost like you need to appeal to other authorities. And I, I mean, I don't like doing the kind of um, psychological tricks to influence people. I really would rather just like point to things yeah, and then just let other people kind of consider it for themselves. But I'm also mindful of it. So, I mean, that's maybe part of why I included the Rosenberg quote in there to have a little bit of authority. And, you know, there's others that shows that like, I'm not just making this up. This isn't just, you know, like me trying to support my worldview. This is serious thinkers who would have maybe very different worldview from my own following this kind of argument. Um, so that would be kind of like the biggest obstacle. Yeah. The, the next one would be what I talked about in that H2O water example. That would be sort of the biggest reply that, well, there are these examples where you can see the same reality from different perspectives. So how do you know that the first person and third person perspectives aren't just looking at the same reality? And there, I think that that just invites us to get clearer about the argument and why consciousness that's within your experience is very different from things outside your experience. That um, And also just to clarify that you can have one reality that has different aspects, right? Because fundamentally, like, I think that I am one thing, like I'm one being, um, but I have arms and, and fingers and thoughts and feelings. And my thoughts and feelings aren't the same thing as my fingers, right? So I have, I already have different aspects and I'm one thing. And by getting that very clear, then I think that helped up to the idea. Oh, okay. So you're not saying that your brain doesn't have anything to do with consciousness or something. It's like, no, I think my brain is actually deeply integrated with my consciousness. I think my brain actually acts as a kind of user interface and it facilitates my interaction with my environment. Um, so those are a couple of the, the first problems I encountered. Yeah, I can actually definitely empathize with that first problem because anytime I talk to some of my materialist or atheist friends about this kind of stuff, um, the, that's the biggest thing that kind of, that's the biggest hurdle is getting over that scientific authority hurdle. So it's so ironic because I mean, all the latest sciences that I've been reading is showing the great power of consciousness to change and affect material systems. 
Yep. And there are all sorts of very interesting specific studies about specific kinds of consciousness that doesn't seem to have any material correlates that are identified. And I'm like reading these things and, but it's difficult because I find that if I actually point to these things, um, if there's already like a narrative about what science says, mm -hmm. then first of all, there's this question like, well, I'm not a scientist, I'm a philosopher. So, so you can't really trust me, you know? And then second, it can feel almost like cherry picking because I'm just like finding things that go against the standard authoritative view. But that's why I don't want people to like, trust me. Like I want people just to go read the science, like go read the latest abstracts, at least in neuroscience, at least read those. Um, you know, I mean, I had a couple cit uh, citations in my presentation, but you know, I, that, that's why I'm all about helping people to see their own powers to do this journey for themselves. I think that's where they're going to see the most, you know, use your own power of introspection, use your own analytical tools, read the science, see how it adds up in your own mind. And it might add up differently than me. And that's totally fine. Right. But if, if there's just a, a narrative that you just think you just know that's what the science says, well, that's tough because if the science actually doesn't say that, <laughs> how are you going to ever find that out? If you don't yeah. Look into it? No, I agree. Yeah. So we got a few more really good questions now. Um, this is actually one of my atheist friends, Dylan. He asks, uh, how would you view correlations between brain states and conscious states? Do you believe consciousness solely affects the brain, that it goes both ways, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So I do. Well, the, the science on this leads me to think that consciousness can certainly affect geometric states. Um, in fact, I also think we can see this just... Um, introspectively that I can form a mental image and then there's actually geometric qualities within the image and I could rotate the image. I was actually just reading um, a book on this earlier today. Uh, I think it's called um, Mind and Images. And then there was another book, Brain and Images um, by Stephen, I'm forgetting his name now, but he talks about rotating images in your own mind and there's actually a geometry there that you can actually affect. You can actually intend to change that geometry and you can get to rotate one way and then you can rotate it another way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's real. And then also the geometry and the structures of your brain. I think consciousness can affect that. Now, can brain structures affect consciousness? Well, yes, definitely. I think there can be causation in the other direction, but we have to get very clear about like, what is the nature of this causation? And I was actually thinking about this the other day in terms of if I'm reading a book, then that book has informational uh, representation that will affect my conscious experience. And if somebody, while I'm reading the book, tears off the pages in the book, that's going to affect my conscious experience. I won't even be able to access the consciousness that, that those pages were encoding or representing. Um, but it doesn't follow that the book itself or the pages themselves are conscious or even that the book is the total explanation of my experiences, because I think what's actually happening is that, um, so, th so this is, this is my view is that the, the brain interacts with conscious states when there's already a conscious being that's in a sense connected to that brain, or ultimately I think that consciousness is actually what grows the brains in the first place. So they grow out of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually the connection between consciousness and and um, nervous systems. It's not that first blind mindless matter organizes into a nervous system and then begins to generate consciousness. It's actually that there's already a conscious being and that one of the things that conscious beings do is that they organize informational states. And then for reasons of, of um, wanting to have a user interface with a certain kind of environment, um, the conscious being can then organize informational states into the form of a brain, which then facilitates interaction with the environment. And um, I'm not saying that this is all like consciously intentional or something like this, but that there's actual consciousness that's involved in that. But that without an actual being, if you just have dead matter, mm -hmm. uh, it will actually never start thinking or feeling like th this will never stop start thinking and feeling. And if you break it into its smallest parts and you throw those parts in different arrangements and you arrange them into the shape of a neuron, they won't start thinking and feeling on their own. The only way that that could happen is if an actual conscious being comes out. And if you have a conscious being that either comes out or is already there or whatever, then you can have the dualistic interaction. It seems to me, at least that's on my model. Okay. 
How many more questions do you think you got left in you? Two more. Two more? Okay, I have to prioritize. <laughs> well, how many are there? I, I've got some time. This is uh, These one, are great two, questions. three, four, five. All right, well, just pick a few and we'll just see how it Sounds goes. good. Okay, so um, Eddie from Brute Facts, you were on his show last week. Oh, yeah. He asks, uh, what, do, what does Dr. Josh think about Kastrup's analytic idealism? It's fascinating. I've been, uh, I read, excuse me, I've been um, watching his presentations and then I read one of his books on this lately. And uh, it's very interesting to me because he does talk a lot about the empirical evidence uh, for his model. Uh, the basic model, so the way he describes a brain is that it's a kind of extrinsic uh, relational appearance of an underlying consciousness. And that actually does make a lot of sense of the empirical studies I'm seeing. Um, there's a lot of overlap. I'm, I'm still kind of processing it. I'm, I'm thinking about how his model fits with um, other models. And um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by it. I mean, it, it does have a lot of explanatory power. Um, let's see. There was a really interesting question. Here it is. It's Eddie again. He says, is the mental is is mental being fundamental a solution to Kant's noumenal phenomenal interaction problem? Hmm. I'm actually really interested in that too. Yeah. Um, this is related to perception. And in my chapter, in my book uh, on consciousness, I talk about different theories of perception. Mm -hmm. And uh, this question is very insightful because it's picking up on something that I've been having these conversations with my wife and like kind of turning over the ideas. It's it's like, I'm starting to think that that there is a kind of problem in perception that you can solve if the mental is fundamental because, and this is directly related to Kant's noumenal phenomenal distinction here because the pr basic problem is the problem of how you can be aware of things external to your consciousness. So, you know, one idea is that um, you sort of represent things in your mind. Like if you have a visual image of a sun, that visual mm -hmm. image of a sun is representing a real sun out there. But then there's this, this problem of the sun, the image of the sun, like how do you actually access the actual sun to sort of compare that the image of the sun has anything to do with like the actual sun, especially if you think the actual sun has geometry and your image encodes <laughs> geometry. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like, how can you actually check to see that there's any resemblance? Um, so that's a kind of a deep problem. And one response is to uh, have a direct realist view where you actually just directly see aspects out there in the world. Um, uh, who was I just reading on this? John Searle has a book on mm -hmm. seeing things as they are, where he makes an argument for this. But then the problem, though, is that if th then you get this other problem of, of hallucination or the problem of illusion where if you have an illusion of the sun and that illusion is phenomenologically in experience exactly the same as like seeing a sun when yeah. you're awake then it looks like there's this problem of what explain what what accounts for the similar experience and one way of accounting for it is that um, you're actually acquainted with the same aspects when you're asleep and when you're awake at least some of them are the same like the color and the shape are the same but then if that's right, then, then um, since the aspects within the visual image when you're dreaming and, hallucination, and hallucinating are mind dependent, then in order to avoid multiplying categories beyond necessity, you might as well just say that the things you're seeing when you're awake are also of the same nature. They're also mind dependent. Uh, and so then it's like, well, what are you going to do? Well, you could actually just be, go ahead and be a direct realist and just say, yeah, actually, um, I can see things as they are, um, and they're all mind dependent. They're all the kinds of things that you witness immediately within consciousness. It's just that in the external world, so to speak, um, there's a certain kind of organized stability in that you and I maybe have similar experiences. And maybe that's because we have similar algorithms that render similar aspects that are in what we would call the shared reality or the external reality. So this is a very insightful question. I think it does point to something I've been thinking about as well, which is that you can solve the problem of perception in terms of a kind of fundamental mentality in a way that you don't have that solution available to use. And it seems 
to add one more thing on this, it seems like when I was reading kind of all the standard options in the problem of perception, like everyone has these deep problems, which is why they're arguing against the other views. But it seems like there's like this thread in all the problems that you can then solve by understanding that the things that you are directly acquainted with in conscious experience are the things that make up the world. Like those are the things. Um, so you are seeing things as they are and you're seeing mental reality. <laughs> so things as they are, are mental reality, um, basically more or less on yeah. this argument. I'm just excited because everything you're just talking about, I didn't want to give any spoil. Like you didn't almost didn't give any spoilers about your new book in it. Mm -hmm. Cause I remember you talking about this, um, in chapter three. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm really excited to keep reading. I still, I still didn't get the chance with the new baby yet. So let's do one more question and I can give you some time back in your day. Sounds so that's great. okay. Sounds great. Um, so it seems that your view is leaning towards some form of Christian idealism on this view. How do you reconcile the physical resurrection of Christ? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, You're not an immaterialist, are you? Well, so, I mean, again, it depends on how you define material, yeah. right? I like the sort of mindful matter that does lead to a kind of idealism. At least that's one way of interpreting it. Another way is panpsychism, although I, I feel like Again, it depends on how you unpack yeah. these things. Um, but I feel like the idealism kind of makes more sense. Or I, I like to just to say that mentality is fundamental from which everything else can be analyzed. And so then I'm going to want to analyze the physical, even the term physical, in terms of um, mental things. Like, for example, I would think of the laws of physics as being based in thought-like structures or propositional uh, contents. And um, then we can think of there being a hierarchy of laws. And so if there's, let's say, a miracle or something like this, like a resurrection event, then what's going on on this analysis is not that there's some kind of like magical, uncaused, or even supernatural event going on there, but rather there's just tapping into a higher mental law um, having to do with even higher purposes like a purpose of displaying a certain kind of uh, meaningful experience or love uh, or communication. And that these would be, it, it's like my core thesis is like personhood is primary to reality. And so everything else, including laws, come out of personhood. And that also then is going to include purposes because persons have purposes. And so then this, this could lead to a resurrection event. And I'm speaking generally because you can apply this principle in other contexts as well. Um, it could lead to something like that, where it's not magical, it actually is type type um, tapping into higher laws, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, well, thank you so much. This is super thank fun. I'm, I'm, I'm super, I'm super excited about this. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to close out with before we close out the stream? This has just been wonderful. Yeah, thank you for this time. I love your studio it looks really awesome. For Thanks well together. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's actually not that impressive. It's just uh, some plywood that I put together. The trimming, I just duct taped on there. <laughs> okay, well, it worked. Looks okay, nice. So, well, thanks everybody for listening. Thank you, Dr. Rasmussen, again. It was an honor to have you on. Super humbling to have somebody like you on the show. Um, and I hope we get to do this again soon. That would be great. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody.